My name is Zachary Ober. I'm the president of Mentorship Works. Mentorship Works facilitates mentorship in three different ways. We provide a world-class mentor-mentee matching system that is completely agnostic from any organization in town. And it is completely unique, something that we haven't seen before in our research. And so the way that's going to work is, actually, let me get a quick show of hands. How many of you have already signed up of a, as a mentor or mentee? Let me see those red dots and blue dots. That's pretty impressive, actually. It's really exciting. So yeah, you've all been entered into our mentor or mentee database. Don't be afraid. <laughs> but uh, well, the way that's going to work is that on June 15th, and we're going to do this once every month, we are going to look at our database, and we are going to match the best mentee with the best mentor. And so that's going to happen once a month. And so that's our mentor-mentee matching system. Our second, our second product, or second, uh, second way of mentor, uh, mentorship that we facilitate, is our online, our online videos. So once you become a member of Mentorship Works, you have access to all our, our online videos. And these videos are interviews featuring uh, our, our founding board member, Jacques Habra, who will be interviewing uh, Kevin O'Connor tonight and more on him later. Um, and and uh, really successful entrepreneurs in town. And, they're, and they are really up close, personal interviews that are really authentic. And it's, it's very rare that you get to see these many successful people um, talk about how mentorship has effect, affected them in these, in these ways. And then our third and final product is our, our, our events. And you happen to be at our first event. And we're really excited that you guys are joining, here, joining us here and launching this program. So I'm now going to introduce Jacques Cabra. He will be conducting the interview tonight. And Jacques is a serial award-winning entrepreneur of technology organizations. <laughs> Somebody thinks that's funny. <laughs> and uh, he also has a lot of experience uh, interviewing tech CEOs. And he is an avid public speaker. And uh, I, he spoke at the Next Generation Summit. I don't know if any of you have heard of that last um, of that event, but he spoke at that last year, uh, and that's how I met him and was inspired by the way he public by the way he speaks. And uh, so it's always an, always an honor to to hear him talk. And um, I'm just really uh, honored and proud to call him a mentor and a friend as well. So uh, please give a warm round of applause for Jacques. And definitely a big applause for Zachary Ober. Zachary's uh, been an amazing leader for our organization, and I think he's going to do some terrific things over the next few years. Now, most people know Kevin O'Connor as a serial, very successful entrepreneur, and that's exactly what he is. Today, he's building a company called Find the Best. It's a research hub, an expert engine for all things, everything from analyzing home values to uh, DVD players to MP3 players. Name it, you name it, they're trying to cover it. It's pretty phenomenal, and uh, we'll talk about that in the interview. What some of you, especially on the younger side, don't know is that this is not Kevin's first startup. I think it's his fourth startup officially, and the other two, there's two out of three that were incredibly successful. One of them is called DoubleClick. It was one of the first true internet advertising plays, certainly one of the ones that was a household name. Later sold to Google for $3.1 billion. Now, you might hear the word billion here and there these days, you know, uh, va values are going up, but this was a long time ago. And so it was a really big deal that he created that kind of value. But most people think, okay, well, that's probably because he's really, really smart and he's really hardworking. And then those are true things about Kevin. But if you really get to know him, and we will tonight, it's also because he's very down to earth. He knows how to build culture. He knows how to look at people regardless of their age or their background or their education and give it to them straight. He doesn't always give you answers to questions. He puts you in a position to answer those questions. And so he is a mentor to a lot of people in his organizations and that's part of the reason, a big part of the reason why he's been so successful. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Kevin O'Connor. Thanks, appreciate you not uh Crediting me with the pop-up ad. <laughs> well, I, uh, I may credit you with that later, but uh, let's talk about raccoons to start. If you like. I did have a conversation with Kevin for Mentorship Works a few months ago, and he shared with me that one of his original innovations 
came out of trying to distract raccoons from bothering his family's trash area, and you engineered something kind of unique, right? Yeah, it was probably my first invention. I was 12 or 13, and raccoon kept knocking over the garbage cans, and I was the garbage, the garbage boy in the house, so I had to get rid of, I had to get rid of it. So I created a contraption to electrocute it. When it <laughs> but it lived. It didn't die. <laughs> it's probably dead now, but it's... It survived, yeah. but never mess with our garbage again. Well, yeah, it wasn't to kill it; it was just to distract it. No. I wasn't too concerned. I wanted it gone, right? And that's how it worked. Well, yeah, I, I, and, and so, so Kevin did not. You did not grow up with a silver spoon in your mouth, where you guys could just call pest control and necessarily and deal with this. No, it was just me. It was just you. How, how was how was your upbringing? I mean, what was it like? What what were you know, your parents and uh, what were they doing? Uh, yeah, mom was a teacher, dad was an engineer. Um, they let me experiment, burn down, almost burned down the house a few times, but they kind of encouraged that. Yeah. Didn't encourage it. They turned the, my dad used to look the other way. Right, right. And so uh, you did go to the University of Michigan. That's where I went to school too. And I've got this University of Michigan t-shirt. This is not my t-shirt, it's much too small. But I want to get this on camera for all the uh, Michigan Go Blue Wolverines. Later. Is that for your kid or what is <laughs> I think it's going to be for my niece. She's uh, almost there yet. I think she's going to probably give that my, my goddaughter. But University of Michigan, electrical engineering. What was that like? What was your focus then at that time? Were you thinking you'd be one day an, an internet industry giant? Well, the inter internet didn't exist back then, so <laughs> no, yeah, I didn't think that. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to get my PhD, go work for Bell Labs, uh, you know, come from Detroit. There, I, I didn't know what an entrepreneur was. It took me 15 years to, to learn how to spell it. Uh, you know, there just wasn't, there wasn't anything like that in Detroit. And then all of a sudden, I got a chance to work on the uh, IBM PC in the early day. Uh, and so this, this, this thing's going to be big. And then uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, I remember, dropping out of college. And so I decided, no PhD, going to go start a company. So I started it the last few months in college. And so when those guys dropped out of college, that was, that was even then seemed like a, a glamorous thing or something that motivated you? Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was clear that you didn't have to have a college degree to, to, to uh, uh, you know, the opportunity was now. You had to seize on an opportunity. There was a huge te technological disjoint going on, and it wasn't going to be around forever. So those, those who were in it early were going to probably do well. Uh, that was the theory. And then, and then, so when that vision started to materialize for you, how did that turn into starting your first or getting involved in one of your first businesses? Yeah, so I mean, we were, you know, we we were tying PCs in the, into uh, uh, mainframe computers back when that was big. So we were pretty excited. We tied tied it in, and, and we didn't. We thought it was just all about you produce a product, people would call you up and buy it. Uh, so we we produced the product and uh, took an ad out in the in the in the in the uh, biz press, and and nobody called. Uh, nobody called at all. So we call, started calling people and calling MIS managers, and they all told us that there's no way a PC would ever be allowed in their company. Uh, so that was pretty depressing. Uh, so we just kept calling and calling, and you know, eventually they snuck their way into the organization. Is there anything today that's like that, that maybe some of these young entrepreneurs should jump on? Like emerging disjoint? <sighs> you know, that's always a tough one. You know, um, uh, you know, I... Technology usually changes it once every 10, 20 years. I mean, mobile clearly is probably the biggest thing that's going on today. Uh, I think there's a lot of false things out there. Like I think alternative energy is, is one of those, it's, it's a bust. Um, a lot of people are gonna lose, lose a lot of time uh, in that market. Uh, Oh, you really put me on the spot. Yeah. Well, that's back. okay. We'll come back to that. So, so let's go back to that, those formative years. So you, you saw a first mover opportunity Right, you started saying this is going to be a standard, and then did you start to surround yourself with certain people that could fill in the gaps on things that you weren't your because you never went to business school and you said you really didn't have much of an entrepreneurship uh, bug at that time. Yeah, I mean, we, we you know I was 22 years old, so we tended to surround ourselves with the older people because we thought you know we were too young and stupid to to figure it out. So I think that was probably the first mistake we mm -hmm. made. But <laughs> okay, so. In some cases, you can figure it out on your own. That didn't come across very well. Uh, yeah, I mean, you look, in, in hindsight, like now, I mean, at Find the Best, we typically hire people that are right out of school. And one thing I've learned is that, especially when you're in a new industry, 
uh, uh, if you look at those who, who have breakthroughs, you know, Nobel Prizes, it's typically done in their 20s, right? Because they don't know any better. That's when they're smartest. Uh, that's when they're, they have the most energy. Uh, they haven't had the creativity beat out of them yet. Uh, they don't know what they're not supposed to do. Uh, so they oftentimes do stupid stuff. Most times it doesn't work, but every once in a while it you know, really breaks through. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think back then we were very cognizant of the fact that we, we were young. We didn't have you know we didn't have a business degree, uh, and I think we we, we over, it was overrated. Mm -hmm. And and that first company, uh, tell us kind of the life cycle of what happened with that one. Yeah, I mean we grew that ten years about thirty five million bucks. I mean I think the big mistake we made there uh, was that you know we had ninety percent market share in a forty million dollar market. So uh, in hindsight, yeah, you know, we did we know how big you know it's tying PCs into a dying uh, mainframe industry. Um, so the next company, which was DoubleClick, which was uh, really wanted to focus on something big. We wanted to focus on a you know, multi-billion dollar industry. And you say we. Who else was in the picture? Uh, well, the partner was Dwight Merriman, who okay. went on to do uh, Guilt and uh, MongoDB. Okay. He's was he older than you? No, no, young. Okay, uh, younger? He was a really young guy. So you, you know, when you and I talked, you talked about one of your first mentors, more on the, the VC side of things, on the investment side of things. Maybe you could tell us a little about that person. And uh, you said that you hadn't really you needed you needed someone to help you uh, level the playing field as you were building companies. So, well, the first mentor was this guy. It was uh, the first company, uh, and we had a board. They were their investors, and so I had a partner, Bill Miller, and his, his dad put up the money, and his dad's friend put up the money. So there was four of us on the board. Uh, three on their side and one on my side. That's the way I kind of looked at it, right? I was young, I didn't know anything about it, and I was paranoid. And I was paranoid that they're gonna take everything over, you know, and I, was, I just didn't know any better. And Ralph McIntyre looked at me one time, and he said, look, here's my resignation, you know, or I will vote whatever you want me to vote. You know, so he just completely trusted. And to me, that was, you know, so we look at mentorship, to me, that was, his, it was that act of selflessness uh, that taught me to trust people. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, because even an, a great employee uh, has a, some degree of selfish interests when they're providing guidance, but a mentor is typically doesn't really. And they're totally selfless. Yeah, and this guy had money, but it wasn't to him. It was more of a, it wasn't a significant part of his wealth or anything. And he did it for fun. He was doing it for fun, so I knew I could completely trust this guy. So in, in those, so when you started DoubleClick, did you have... Of course, in hindsight, it was even if he did resign, it was still two against one. Right. But the intention was really, really good. <laughs> so uh, the the initial launch of DoubleClick, take us back to the maybe the first couple of years. This is a, a company that was later sold to Google for three point one billion dollars. Unfortunately, I wasn't there when we sold it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, so the beginning times of DoubleClick, we were looking at what was going to be. Uh, you know, we we're going to focus our time. What was going to be a big disjoint? And it wasn't clear that the internet was going to be um, uh, was going to happen. Uh, but as it was starting to evolve, and we we're sitting there thinking, okay, uh, here's a technology that would give everyone in the world access to all information and knowledge for free. That sounds like a pretty good concept. So we thought that would be big. Then we started thinking about how what's the economic? How are people going to make money? Right. So back then it was all government and universities. But how are people going to make money? So. You know, think about it, you're building a new city. You know, what are people going to need? They're going to need plumbing. You know, they're going to need, you know, garbage service. So, you know, we started thinking, okay, what's the economics? And originally we were going to do, um, uh, 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 we thought it was going to be a subscription-based model. So you buy a subscription, you get access to websites. And uh, then Dwight said, why don't we do it for advertising? And we said, okay, that, that's it. Advertising always wins in every medium. When people have, could pay a dollar or get it for free, they're going to go free all the time. So. Decided to do advertising, uh, and so really the big challenge was getting people to. Uh, our co our competition was another internet advertisers because there were none. It was really pulling dollars away from TV and print and everything else. So we had to really proselytize uh, why the internet was going to be important, and we had to prove it. So we really focused on proving that this was going to happen. And once we proved it, then then it was then it all happened. Uh, and then there was so much money pouring into the into the market. I mean, there's so much VCs and so much public public money pouring in. Billions and billions of dollars, uh, so it was pretty pretty rapid. What year was this? Uh, we started in 1995, uh, right at the beginning. The original name was Internet Advertising Federation. It sounded like something out of Star Trek. Um, naming was never one of my strong, strong, right. strong suits. And so, w when when you took this 
you know, selling, selling the concept, selling the industry, which I full well understand, I went through the same thing in 1996, did, did you go directly to the end buyers of the advertising or did you go to the channel partners like the, the, you know, the big advertising agencies and, and the big PR agencies? We went to anyone that would pick up the phone. You know, we went to the agencies, they were the blockers, uh, they wouldn't do it, so we go around them. And once you go around an agency, then they get really paranoid. Then they may listen to you. So we went to anybody that would listen. Uh, and then they start calling us. Um, you know, they wanted to get educated. All of a sudden, the agencies are kind of, yeah, we're not interested. I mean, how, how exciting is a, a banner, you know? I'd rather produce a 60-second TV commercial rather than a banner. Uh, but once their clients started saying, hey, this thing looks like it could be real, uh, then they wanted to know more about it. Mm -hmm. And so we really took a kind of an educational approach, educating them on, you know, the internet and why it's going to become important and, and really focus on the measurement, proving that it worked. What was the initial investment uh, to start this? Uh, 150 grand, I think. Mm -hmm. so, so not an enormous amount of money. No. I mean, most companies today are still built on uh, $25,000 initial seed, which was, a, you know, ICC was 25 grand. Uh, most companies are still 25 grand. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Find the Best was that much. I mean, Find the Best was probably started out with a quarter million. Yeah, your first few years, you were operating out of the uh, garage, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. It was a nice commute. And then the, um, you know, I always Find the Best was a bit like uh, Forest Company starts that run across the country. We're like, yeah, let's, you know, we'll, we'll do, uh, we'll compare ski resorts. All right, All right compared to ski resorts, that, that works. And we compared, compared colleges, and then we compared uh, golf courses. And, and next thing you know, we're... We have something like, I don't know, 2,000 topics and almost, almost a billion items that we're um, comparing. And we just launched homes last week, so yeah, to go against Zillow and Trulio. Awesome. we didn't have enough competition. Well, everybody, you know, home ownership is one of our standards in America. Good research. I'm pulling out my questions here. I've got a few that, I, that the audience is asking that are going to start dovetailing in here. So what, what, what were some of the inflection points in the first few years of DoubleClick? Because the dot-com bu bust was, what, 2001, to late 2000? Yeah, 2001, I think. Yeah, 2001. So you, you essentially built most of your value in a really fast, highly accelerated pace, right, between 1995 and 2000. Yeah. Okay, so... Take us through that a little bit. You know, what were some of the decisions that were made? What were some of the moves that you made that, that reached? Because you know, this isn't like this. This is like, you know, hitting plateaus. Yeah, I mean, you, we, we went, it was a crazy time. We went from uh, like two employees in my basement to 2,500 people in 25 countries in, I think, five or six years. So wow. it was just, a, just an insane uh, uh, path, and then it just slammed into the wall. Uh, so that was an inflection point. Uh, that was a big, a big inflection point when 75% of your customers go bankrupt uh, in a period of you know a month. Yeah. Uh, so there's a few layoffs. Uh, yeah, that was unfortunate. Um, that was hard. Um, now on the bright side, a lot of those guys went to Facebook and Google, so they were pretty, they were pretty happy. Yeah, and they had um, an education from yes. their experience. Yeah, yeah. So people were looking for folks like that. So. Um, but yeah, that was pretty rough. Uh, that was an inflection point. Uh, the whole privacy, we, get, we were embroiled in the whole privacy issue. That was, that was no fun. Tell us about that. Uh, do I have to? Yeah. Yeah, so that was just, you know, I mean, all of a sudden we became, um, uh, you know, today, I mean, you know, what's done today is, was way worse than whatever, what, what we were ever trying to do. You know, we're targeting people with cookies, trying to get, make advertising relevant so it would work. And, Next thing you know, we, uh, uh, someone put out a story in the USA Today, a business section. People, I was shocked that people even read that. But um, it all of a sudden exploded into this you know, massive thing, uh, huge controversy. So we were the post poster child. I was a poster boy for, for the privacy. So that was, that was, uh, yeah, now you're that kinda, was no fun. You're kind of giving back, though, with these uh, patent trolls. You, know, you put up your own money. For those of you that don't know what a patent troll is, uh, some young entrepreneur, or in, or in this case, uh, a very seasoned entrepreneur, comes out with a technology, a product, a business, and takes it to market. And right when they're starting to do well, they get a phone call from an attorney that says, hey, you're uh, violating my patent. You owe me $100,000. 
or to shut down your business, I'm gonna shut you down, and that's exactly what happened to Kevin. Somebody called him up and told him that find the best, the way that they were collecting data and they were offering data was violating their patent, and Kevin was like, oh, I, I, this isn't my first time here. And what, what happened there? Well, it's pretty funny. They, um, in fact, Danny's been, Danny was heavily involved. We, we found out today that uh, the lawyer, the lawyer called us up. We, we called the lawyer to figure out, like, you're mistaken. We don't do any of this stuff. It's, it's garbage. Uh, you made a mistake. And the guy was a complete jerk. He's like, pay me 50,000 bucks. We won't go away. And we, and we kept threatening. We said, look, this is going to end very poorly for you. And today, <laughs> what happened? He was fired from his firm. <laughs> Uh, so that yeah. was sweet, uh, and he got sanctioned by the New York uh, the New York uh, bar. Um, yeah, yeah, but but Kevin went around the whole. Uh, Unfortunately, basically the Congress whole, chickened out. They, they, they won't pass patent. They didn't pass patent reform. What a surprise! Yeah, but they're they're working on net neutrality. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> right. So I, I don't know if they they know they how all this works. Stay away from the internet. Yeah. Well, I I think that a lot of young people have uh, a, an interesting perception on startups and technology companies. They see a guy like Mark Zuckerberg in the movie. How many people have seen The Social Network? You guys remember the scene where Mark Zuckerberg goes back to the VC in his pajamas to basically say, uh, you know, too bad you missed out? Remember that scene? And, uh, you know, people kind of celebrate that. I mean, what do you think about that kind of behavior? Do you think it's good? Do you think it's bad? I mean, I don't think you should... Ever be an asshole to anyone. Yeah. I mean, that's my theory in life. Do you own any Facebook stock? You know, I did. I bought it at the IPO okay. and got crushed and sold it at the low point. Okay. I'm really good. It's, I'm better at Okay. You don't oh. want stock tips from me. No. So I, th I, I think... But you know what? Like, the guy was young. Yeah. I did stupid. I did so many stupid things when I was young. So, I mean, that's what mentors are for, right? I mean, we're supposed to be wise. Right. And know how to hold her liquor. That's important. Yeah. Is that a technique when you're interviewing uh, some important executives? You take them drinking and see what happens? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. I'll try. But there's a good thing that, yeah, you can never win a corporate event. So. I see. Through drinking. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, the Find the Best Culture's got a, a great reputation. Uh, you know, as far as being very open, fostering mentorship, as you said. Wh how do you do that? How do you do that day to day? Build that kind of culture? So, I mean, one of the things that we do within the company is, I mean, look, I'm by far, I'm probably the oldest guy by two uh, there. So it's, it's pretty, most folks are coming right out of school. Um, so I, I guess I act as a mentor, but it's tough to be a mentor when you're also, also the CEO. So, I mean, that's always... Difficult, but I try to do it. You know, I try to um, deal with people you know, really honestly, and you know, I bring wisdom, and they bring excitement and new ideas. So it's a good, good balance. But one of the things that we do, we have a find the best university. We we invite people in uh, from all walks of life that accomplish something that's pretty interesting. They can bring in their life lessons, and then we've we've established some mentorships between uh, uh, some of the folks, folks with them. So that's worked out pretty well, and they're excited, right? I mean, a mentor. I mean, it's, it's a two-way street. You know, mentors love it because they get they get exposed to young folks with new ideas and they want to stay current. They want to stay, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And some people, you know, without that, being the mentor, they really get stuck, bored, and, you know, they want to continue to have that excitement. But one of the, let me just, on the double click thing you were asking, so one of the uh, inflection points, so it crashes, right? And we, and one of our board members was Tom Murphy. I went, Tom Murphy was the CEO of, um, uh, ABC and Warren Buffett said he was the best CEO in the, on the planet. And he was, and I went and I approached him to join our board. And Tom Murphy's a great guy. He's like, Kevin, I don't know anything about the internet. And, you know, I said, Tom, we don't need, we know about the internet. We need like, we need oh, someone wise. Um, and this guy was just so good. And so here we are. The stock, the, 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 the um, uh, all the internet stuff crashes. We have all this excess real estate. We're all we arguing about it. We have fifty million dollars in real estate, right? No one ever wants to write off real estate. So you're trying to figure out: Do we hold it? Is the market going to survive? Is it going to turn? Then 9/11 happened. You know, and all you're sitting on this huge excess real estate because you're growing like this. Um, and we're arguing at the board. You know, we're taking a look at all the different, you know, weighting, weighted risks and returns and all that stuff. And Tom Murphy like Kevin, I'm like uh, yeah, Tom. Say, uh, are we in the real estate business? Like, uh, no, Tom, you know, we're in the internet business. Uh, that's what I thought. 
sell the goddamn real estate. <laughs> and I was like, that's what a mentor does to me. It's just, he, he, he clears it away. He makes it so simple. I'm like, that, dang it, Tom. You know, that's exactly, you know, it was so clear. Right, uh, even at a loss. He takes away all the emotion. Oh, look, as CEO, it was my decision to get all that real estate. And that's the problem, is that you're tied in. You know, you've got this vested interest, uh, and you can't do it. You need someone that just, just doesn't have that, that vested interest mm -hmm. that can make it clear to you. I'll go to the... Uh, Are you actually getting tweets? I am getting a lot of tweets. Really? Yeah, I've got about <laughs> Who's ten. tweeting out there? Okay, we, we asked that I one. I don't think there's... Is it, what do you think uh, Santa Barbara as a community has? Uh, what kind of advantages does it have over other tech epicenters like the Silicon Valley? That, this was asked by John Osley. So I'm not, yeah, I've never done the math here, but per capita, we may have more tech than probably, not, maybe not Silicon Valley, but probably anywhere else in the country. We have a lot of tech companies here, surprising number, right? We just, have, we just have no capita here. So that's, that's the problem, there's right? no people. Now we find it very effective when we, we recruit uh, people from college, you've got to like wash you in St. Louis or bring them here in, in February. <laughs> <laughs> or Michigan. So what does Santa Barbara have to offer? I mean, it's, you know, it's a great place. Now there's some, there's d downsides. I mean, for young people, it's, it's not the most exciting town, right? Newly wed, newly dead. So have you been to the funk zone? Nearly dead. Sorry. Not nearly dead. Have you been to the funk zone? It's, it's, no, I don't. It's, I actually, it's turning I've things around. I've been down there, but. Santa Barbara's on a revival. I don't hang down there, but. And you know, and I think the advantage, I mean, all the stories I've done have actually been outside Silicon Valley. And I think one advantage is, is that you, you're not, you know, it's a, it is a bit of a, a echo chamber up there, right? There's all this, that's not life. You know, you look at the seven billion other people on the planet, you know, they don't sit there and talk about technology, you know, all day long. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they have other stuff to do. Well, that dovetails to something that uh, DJ and I were talking about on our way up here. Uh, he, he comes into the office super early and he says that there's no cars in the parking lot. And then when he leaves, there's no cars in the parking lot. You called me two days ago so we could prep for this. At 7 o'clock, you were leaving your office, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's I a left early. I felt bad. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, that's unusual. From what I, I see, a lot of like, uh, it's just tough to work 60 hours here. I think it's easy. You do? Here, yeah, yeah, we we do uh, we play basketball at lunchtime. I'm mean, I dressed in workout shorts. We we do walk arounds outside. Outside's our most popular conference room. I mean, it's it's sweet. You know, what's the commute? Ten minutes? It's anywhere? Right. That's awesome. That sounds Pretty like cool. a really exciting call. Let's get a basketball hoop, DJ. That'll change things. So, what about everyday passion? What is it like your everyday passion that wakes you up, drives you throughout the day? This was asked by. Sat Kirit, where is he? He's right here, yeah. So somebody I was interviewing someone the other day, and he was uh, uh, a psych major. He was, he was telling me about a study how uh, sociopaths and entrepreneurs are almost, I, they're identical. Um, <laughs> and I always felt that way. It's like I'm glad that technology and inventing was my, was my obsession and not like serial killing or you know, gambling or, or drugs or something. Um, so I mean, that's... That's my, my, I mean, it sounds a little goofy, but I've always, Come I, on. Just, I dig technology, man. You just like I'm, creating new things. Yeah, I love inventing. But to me, I mean, our approach to business has always been, it's not about, it's not about money. It's about uh, finding a big problem and solving it elegantly, better than anyone else, right? If you do that, I mean, that's how you create value, right? If you solve a problem, uh, you're creating value. If you do it better than anyone else, people are gonna give you money. Uh, that's my theory. It's my mm -hmm. engineering. That's what happens when you go to business school. Yeah, you have to come up with. It's, it's simple as that. Yeah. Novel theories. When did you start find the best? Uh, four and a half years ago. JD Block was curious, and then we talked about patents for a minute. What is the value of patent taking out patents? Do you recommend it? Are you for it? Against it? Should one patent? This was asked by Patrick Gregston. I mean, I'm, I mean, I think business process patents, software patents are complete garbage. I think they're worthless and they're not worth the paper they're written on. So save your 25 grand. Yeah. So just get first to market and start creating value. Yeah, I mean, actually create something and, and get market share and that's your best defense against anything. Mm -hmm. We actually gave away, uh, we had a patent at DoubleClick and I went through the whole lawsuit thing and I, and I vowed never to do it again. And we, we, we were on the attack. 
And uh, we bought this piece of crap company. Uh, but they had this. We were going through their list of assets, and they owned this patent. And it was basically the PayPal patent. And uh, we gave it to eBay. Oh. It's part of a business deal, but when we gave this? it to them. We were kind of in the final stage of negotiation. They wanted our, our double-click uh, ad services cheaper. We said, yeah, tell you what, we'll chuck in this um, you know, really important patent for you. And, so, and when was this? Uh, 2000. 2000. Oh, wow. I don't know. Might have been one of those. Very, gener very generous. <laughs> Maybe of you, one of the Kim. dumber things I've done in life. But <laughs> I just, you know, I just don't believe in patents. Who, 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 here, who here believes in business process patents? Really? Yeah. So, do you believe in software patents? Renewable energy patents? That's two strikes so far. Well, I'm, anyway. I'm, I'm keeping track. I wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, definitely don't spend your money on patents. Uh. How many engineers in, in the uh, crowd? How many coders, hardcore engineers? There's one, two, three, a couple back there, a couple here. There, there's, this, uh, there's this belief, this feeling out there that in order to have a successful tech company, the founder or one of the founders must be an engineer. So is that a statement or a yeah, question? It's a question. Oh, uh, uh, I mean, look, I was doing VC before Find the Best, and, and that, I would say that was one of my uh, must-haves. Okay. Like, I don't see you can do a tech company without being a uh, technologist. You can't outsource it or hire that out? I mean, anyone who outsources technology, there's no way. It's your core competency. Now, you know, Jeff Bezos did pretty damn well not being a technologist. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it can be done. I don't know what his, I don't know if he founded it with a CTO, or I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the specifics, but in my experience, uh, you look at some of the great tech companies, there is... There's always technologists. Because I don't, I don't understand how you can, I mean, technology is the hard part. To me, business is simple. Technology is hard. Hmm. And marketing is, uh, as far as the balance between the two, you give more weight to the engineering. Oh, I think our marketing person is in the audience. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I mean, our company, I think, is organized this way. It's, it's, it's a round product, right? You got If you don't solve the problem, you don't have a company, right? So that's got to be number one. Um, and then marketing, really, I mean, what's marketing? It's, it's uh, you know, branding is, is the experience that you have with the product. So, you know, most of our marketing really centers around, are we delivering on the promise that we make people? Uh, you know, the other stuff, advertising, yeah, that's all very, very important, right? You got to sell. You right. If you don't sell, you, 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 you know, sell, sell, selling solves all problems. Brings money in the door, lets you invest more in technology. Certainly. And then uh, Kevin D correlated with marketing. Kevin D. Kevin D. He asks, you mentioned you're bad at naming companies. How do you feel about Find the Best as, <laughs> as a name? Is this Davis? <laughs> we argued so long about like company. Well, first of all, who here has ever tried to uh, name a name a, a dot com? It is a it's really tough. Finding a domain. There are no domains domains available. So then you come up with stupid names, uh, you descriptive names, and somehow find the best was was around. So, you know, it's one of those things that everyone's got an opinion. On it. You know, at the end of the day, I'm not. You know, I always ask people this question: What do great brands have in common? What is it? The name. You know, people say, "Oh, it's got four. You know, it's easy to remember." No. Is it, well, what do great brands have in common? Anyone want to take a guess? What's that? Loyalty, share That's the market. A, Danny's heard this, this speech before. They got great product, right? I mean, they have great market. They have big market share because they've got great product. I mean, all great brands have great product. So at the end of the day, you got to have a great product. I mean, who would have thought Google? Really, great name? It's a stupid name, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what else? There's lots of other names. Lots of stupid names. Yahoo. Is Uber a good name? Uber. Uber. I didn't think Uber was going to be, I, you know, I thought Uber was going to be a disaster. How many people here use Uber? What a great, unbelievable product. I thought eBay was, just, I remember I had a uh, 1996 in the spring. I was with uh, uh, Martin Wesley. Have you heard of him? I think he was running for controller, maybe his controller. I don't know. He, was a, he had just dropped out. I had lunch with him. I was trying to sell him our stuff. He had dr just taken a leave from uh, Stanford to, to join this company, and he was describing it. It was eBay. And uh, I was like, 
I go back to the office. I said, you'll never believe this guy. What a loser. Drops out of Stanford to do a garage sale online. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a winner. It worked, out, it worked out pretty good. Uber is great. I think that's one of my favorite favorite products. Now everything's Uber. I do business plan competition. We're Uber for delivery. We're Uber for massage services. You know, it's like it's Uber for everything. Okay, so let's bring this back to the, the personal Kevin O'Connor. I made that one up. That's not a bad. What was it? Uber for massage services. Uber for mas crowdsourcing <laughs> massage services. You, you better know what you're buying. <laughs> that's good, yeah. You know, why not? Okay, next one. I'm gonna <laughs> okay. Next. So uh, Bethany wants to know, what's your secret to inspiring entrepreneurs to join your vision? Uh, the secret. There's always the secret. Uh, I mean, there is no secret. I mean, like, I believe what we're doing, right? So I think when people, when people um, hear it, and it makes sense, and they hear, hear me uh, talk about it, I mean, they get excited. You know, I mean, not everyone does. I mean, some people that look at it, it's like I looked at eBay and said, I'm stupid product. Um, but, you know, I'm generally really, really interested. And I interview with everybody, and I love, love you know, it's the number one th thing I look for people when we hire is are they passionate, All right? Mm -hmm. So I would, uh, how many people here would like to hear Kevin's one minute pitch on why he believes in Find the Best? Oh, well, I think pretty much every hand is up right now, Kevin. Can we hear like the the passionate "I want to work for Kevin" inspirational? One minute. Oh, man, you really put. Me the, and and, and put we're me not doing spot. this to to necessarily join Find the Best, although maybe some people will. But just to kind of get a an we idea. We are of, hiring, so. Yeah, and we want to get an idea of how it's done. So find the best. We help you research with confidence. You know, we have thousands of topics that allow you to figure out all of your options, you know, whether it's finding a college, a nursing home, a CRM software, um, uh, dogs, you know, anything you want. It's completely unbiased. Uh, we allow you to find out what's most important to you, show your range of options. Uh, we put data into context, uh, which is really important. So, you know, what is a you know, you look at a, 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 a smartphone as a 22-hour talk time. W what does that mean? You know, how is that compared to other phones of, of my choices? How does that relate to um, uh, talk time relate to screen size or, or battery life? Yeah. Uh, so we put data into context so people can make meaningful decisions uh, that are best for them. And no, you're not done. <laughs> He's not done, sorry. And we pay, <laughs> and we also give, well, yeah. I mean, we give, everyone's an equity holder in the company. Uh, and people have incredible uh, autonomy to do what they uh, do what they need to do. Awesome. And we pay very, you know, we pay, yeah. I, Go I ahead. thought that was good. That's, That's good. <laughs> I'll hold my applause. And we are hiring, so. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, you just talked about uh, the smartphone, which is, I think, in our civilization, maybe as like significant as the wheel, you know, in terms of making progress. Bigger. Bigger. I mean, every day there's a digital. Anyone can say that. Bigger than fire. This guy's shaking his head over there. I was a joke. Don't worry. <laughs> it is bigger I than fire, though, don't you think? <laughs> I read a book called uh, The Future of the Mind by Michio Kaku, this physicist. Has anybody read this book? I'll halfway. halfway through. You've got to check out this book. It's pretty crazy fascinating. But he talks about how at a physical level, in terms of pure physics, that you can now, you ought to be able to download the neurology of the brain, literally digitize your brain, and thereby digitizing your consciousness. I mean, literally, Kevin O'Connor, we just download where you are, every experience, everything you've seen, everything you've felt, get a snapshot, a mirror image of your brain, and uh, God forbid something happens to you, we can have a conversation with you, kind of like the movie Her. But he's saying that the problem right now is engineering that there isn't the engineering, but they're working on it. And we see, I think the smartphone is this mechanism towards that, towards taking this data footprint that we create every day. Where, where do you see this? Where, where's your, where do you see things in 50 years when you're hopefully uh, still developing companies? I'll be dead by then. No, so. Kurzweil thinks you're gonna be alive till 130 if you're under uh, like, you're a little over 50, but. If you're under 50. There's nothing in the there's nothing that forecasts that we're 130 is is in the foreseeable future. So I'm not sure where he's getting that. 
Well, the, the, the he's pace. an older guy who's hoping that. I mean, we're gonna need some. <laughs> we're gonna need some big breakthroughs for that. No, I mean, I, one, of my, one of my favorite charts is you look at Moore's Law, right? And and you look at it's it's been incredibly predictive of where uh, CPUs are going and processor speed. And you know, we're at about a dog stage right now. And you know, it's probably you know pretty reasonable. So you can take a look. I think it's going to be taking like another 15, 10 to fifteen years where we we cross over the human the human. So I don't know if that's true. I mean, there's more than just processor speed and and um, but you know, I mean, the amazing you know memory, right? I mean. A, you know, we, we get gigabytes now. Gigabytes, uh, when I first got into the business, giga gigabytes didn't even exist. I think that was the entire uh, memory system. I, I, well, how much were megabytes back in 1983? I mean, there were millions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, your kid throws away. I mean, how many of those, those, those uh, what are those things, those USB things? Yeah, like, what are those? Five gigabytes now? And you, they're, they're everywhere. You throw them away like pennies. So are there, are there thing, uh, what kind of a world are we going to live in? Where is the next? So I think it's interesting. To, to, to me, the three biggest trends going on are, are um, processor speed approaching zero, uh, memory approaching zero, and, and bandwidth approaching zero. It's all approaching zero. I don't know what it means, but <laughs> it means cheap. Those are the trends you're seeing. It's cheap, cheap of everything. Yeah. Okay. Well, Bethany also wanted to know what are some of the daily routines and habits that you engage in that contribute to your personal success? The daily habits. I drink coffee. Uh, I work out. Um, you work out every day? Uh, yeah, yeah. Nice. I go do. Yeah. Yeah, poorly. <laughs> but it doesn't matter as long as it's a workout. So uh, I don't really have any, I don't. I like to think. Thinking's like relaxing to me, not, not thinking. I mean, if I don't, if I want to not think, I'll go to sleep. So <laughs> you don't wake up in the m in the middle of the night thinking about things? Oh, I do. How often? I'm mean, usually in the morning, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I wake up, I don't I don't know. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that question. What is the psychology of Kevin O'Connor? <laughs> Sociopath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Okay, so I think th that question to me is really important beyond um, beyond the obvious because a lot of people look at you and they think, you know, wh what makes you different uh, than me? You know, how can I be more like you? And I think they want to get a sense of, uh, you know, some of your habits, some of your behaviors, the way that you think, the way that you approach things. Are there s things that you really enjoy reading? Uh, are there uh, certain mechanisms that you take on every day that are unique? So, you know, I try to... I try to figure out, I mean, I've spent 35 years trying to figure out innovation, right? So I think a lot of what we do at Find the Best is we practice this all the time. We just had a test. We just, had anyone here use Tiny Pulse? They sent out a question. Um, they Up sent out a question. It's, it's a pretty cool, cool uh, system. They send out one question to all the employees, like uh, hundreds of companies, and just it's a quick poll. And one of them is, you know, is the company innovative? And I think we're at like 99% right now, uh, which is I've never seen in, in uh, the, the, some other companies I worked in. Uh, we just practice innovation continuously. We innovate on everything we do. Um, and I think that's the big one, right? We, we approach everything, okay, what's the problem we're trying to solve, all right? Here's, our, here's every possible solution to that problem, 100 of them. And then we divide uh, the number of solutions by uh, possible solutions by three, and then everyone gets a vote. And so you vote, and you quickly narrow it down from 100 to three. And then so what you've done there is you've, you've, you've eliminated chasing 97 things that are irrelevant uh, in, a l in, in weeks or months of discussion, uh, you build a consensus and you come up with the best solution very quickly. Now, the three may not be the best solution, so what we do then is we, we constantly iterate and test. We, we call it test, fail, learn, test, fail, learn, test, to succeed, scale the shit out of it. Um, that's our theory. So we go into things kn knowing, thinking that we don't know the answer uh, we don't have the hubris that we know know the answer. We have a hypothesis, and we, and we think it's a pretty good hypothesis. And, and the hypothesis of find the best hasn't changed dramatically uh, over time, but it's definitely evolved. So it's uh, a process. So yeah, it's a process of, of forcing innovation and continuing innovate. And everyone does it in the company. And we generate thousands of ideas on a, on a, on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. Now, most ideas suck, and that's the first, the first thing you, uh, you know, we're really, really tough on ideas, and you can't pursue a thousand ideas. So, you got to you got to narrow it down to four or five. But 
you can't just, a lot of people think of, and this is I think the biggest thing uh, that I, when I talk about entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and stuff like that is you've got to, uh, the best way to come up with one unbelievable idea is to come up with a 10,000 really stupid ideas. Mm. Yeah, it's a process, it makes sense. But you gotta force it, you can't sit around going, okay, you know, we literally, we came up with, before double click, I mean, we did that, we, 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 we would focus on a problem and then we came up with 100 different, um, uh, really legitimate companies. When when is it clear that it's not going to work and you got to give up on a product or an idea? Uh, I mean, how many times do you iterate? How many how much money do you put into something? How much market research do you go into it before you say enough is enough? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, you know, you go out. You market validate it. You know when you, you release the product and it just doesn't provide value. So you know, you, something you doesn't provide value. It doesn't make someone's life more entertaining or more uh, uh, bring them money, make them money, or or bec make them more efficient. Yeah, there's no product. Right. Right. But I'm I'm like let's take your example of what you've just done with uh, find is it find the home or find it's find the best homes. Find the best homes. So with Find the Best Homes, you are going up against two companies that have tremendous market share in Zillow and is it Trulia, right? Yeah. Yeah. What is your hypothesis? So our secret sauce is that we, we approach, the, these guys are all in vertical sort of, so you got Kayak for Travel, you got you know Kelly Blue Book for Cars, you got Zillow for Real Estate, um, Yelp for Local Services. So we've created this platform. And our ability, you know, for example, Zillow and Trulia have 1,000 people, they've been working on this problem for 10 years. Uh, we produced what industry experts are telling us are, is a better product. We did it with six months and nine people. Um, so we, we're able to, because we have a platform, a data platform that can, that can, that can uh, ingest massive amounts of information, uh, we can produce these products very cheap. So I don't know if you've ever read Innovator's Dilemma. If you want to, uh, probably the most influential book I've ever read is Innovator's Dilemma, especially in the technology market, is, is the low-cost provider uh, always wins. So our view is that you know we can do these things for a hundredth the price. Uh, I mean Zillow, um, they need to charge people, realtors, a, a lot of money. We don't. And you're gonna? It's monetized by advertising. Yeah. Okay. I I interview. Uh, I didn't interview. There was a guy who presented at MIT last month, uh, Doc Searles, who who basically said that advertising as we know it on the internet is dead, and that the, the shift is upon That's us. A bummer. What's the shift to? Uh, Everyone always says that. By well, the way. It, it's it's because you know the acceleration. His his theory is that the ex the the demand for the person to get exactly what ad they want at that time in that moment is not the, the the desire and the need for that is not being met by the speed of the technology of being able to provide that. So people are going to be turned off by advertising. They're going to start getting away from it, and they they prefer to pay for. You know, it's kind of the opposite of one of the double-click theories you had you know, 20 years ago. So I'm not sure, I don't know Doc Searle, but I don't know if he's talking about permission marketing. I mean, there's always been the, the end of advertising, and it just never never happens. I mean, advertising is a way for people to communicate, right? I mean, I mean, look, our, our site is, is, to, is to minimize marketing, is to people to come in and find what's best as opposed to, the, you know, our view is that in a market, you got, the marketer knows everything, and the consumer is down here. So the marketer is a lion, consumer is a baby gazelle. Uh, they have all the information. So we give everyone the information so they can do a, they can figure out what's best for them. Mm -hmm. But advertising, right? I mean, w we help people compare a Ford truck to a Nissan truck. Well, maybe Nissan's having a um, you know fifteen hundred dollar you know rebate. It's pretty useful to to a consumer. Yeah, and, and he would agree with you wholeheartedly that there's more power for the individual than ever before. Absolutely. I mean, which is an incredible amount of power it, and it's, knowledge. It's really, really shifted to dangerous ways, though. I mean, I think sometimes the power has shifted too far. Like for example, it's just too easy to to um, too easy to, to game the system sometimes, right? Whether it's trashing companies or you know trashing individuals mm -hmm. anonymously. So, yeah. but people will they'll settle out. Yeah, reputation management online is uh, <laughs> unbelievably interesting. So a big, a big theory of ours was, was also was that information symmetry 
information asymmetry actually freezes the market. Marketers think it's good for them, but information symmetry, when people have more information, right? People are mostly hesitant, hesitant to make a decision because they think they're missing something. And the uh, guy at the University of Chicago won a Nobel Prize it's called, on, on the subject. It was called the market of lemons, the used cars, and you know, kind of proved that the used car market is too, too detailed to go into. But basically, the more information you got, the faster mark, the better it is for good products and, and, and uh, the market in general. So information, though marketers were afraid of it, it's actually very good for the, they're, they're starting to embrace it. They, they realize, mm -hmm. look, cat's out of the bag. They better learn to, learn to uh, live with it. Right. Uh, anybody got a question for Kevin? Yes, I'm gonna repeat the question after the question's asked so we can get it on camera. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, okay. So the question is, uh, you, we talked about building a culture, but how do you maintain the culture to get to, once you're at like 2,500 employees, growing that fast? Yeah, so I, I, there's probably a couple ways. One is just, you know, I'm very involved with hiring, so you're bringing on people that you think embody that culture, and then you promote people that, that promote that culture. So, you know, for example, we have an MO that we, we hire smart athletes, right? We're looking for super smart IQ people, high IQ, that can solve complicated problems, that we're, we're very competitive in some, whether it's sports or debate or something. They put themselves out there. They've worked on a team. They know that they got to do 100 hours of practice before they get an hour of, of actually uh, performing. So, you know, we, we look for that, you know. And then and it really comes down to um, uh, a lot of it comes down to the CEO and the execs actually abiding by that culture and then promoting and, and uh, rewarding and punishing based on those that don't, don't abide by it. You know, I think two, people make exceptions, and, and it's the exceptions, right? And we, we had a sale, top sales guy. This guy's, guy was bringing in something like 20 million bucks a year. He cheated on his expense report. Oh. It was insane. It was, and he did it, you know, I mean, it, I don't know, he, maybe he stole two, $3,000. It was nothing. I mean, his commission checks were, you know, 100,000 bucks. But it was, it was un untenable. You know, you, you can't allow it. Because when you got that, then that leads to people cooking the books, and, you know, it, it always comes down to, to bite you. And then, and then doing it more, really more doing it. You know, I mean, you're gonna put all the platitudes you want on the wall, but you know, if you don't, if you don't abide by it, then people know it's a joke. You know, if they see the CEO stealing for whatever, you know, um, then they're gonna, you know, just it, it all trickles down. Thanks, Peter. There's a question back here. Yeah. Um, How much of your success would you attribute to luck or chance? Or timing, I'll add that, and why? I mean, I, that's always, I, uh, who knows, right? I mean, I, I, I like, I love um, Arnold Palmer's thing, you know, the more, the more I practice, the luckier I get. You know, I think that's a great sort of saying. I mean, if you put yourself in a situation, what I always tell, tell people getting out of school or, or, or kids, I mean, you always want to um, have as many opportunities, put yourself in a position to have as many opportunities as, as you can, right? And when you do that, one of those opportunities is going to probably be pretty good. And if you keep doing that through life, then, you know, you tend to get that. And now I happen, you know, my um, uh, sociopath happened to be in technology, right? And so I happen to hit on, on probably the fastest growing industry in the history of the, history of the world, right? So I very, very, is that luck? I have no idea. You know, I got fascinated with it for a random series of events, and, you know, I liked it. So, so yeah, that definitely helped, no, no doubt. Now it can't no be doubt. luck because there's a lot of people that, tried to do what you did and it didn't work out with the internet. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I got plenty of tax write-offs too in investing, so. Right. <laughs> there's no, there's definitely, definitely yeah. a period, there's definitely lots of luck. And you know, I think the big thing is I go into this stuff, I, I to me, everything is, I net everything to, at zero. I don't put any, all that stuff I, I like push away and and because you start forming hubris, you start, oh, I did that, you know, I'm gonna be successful. And no, past success doesn't guarantee or, you know, maybe it opens some doors, you know, people listen to you a little bit more, you give, give you a little credibility, your reputation's a little bit better, but it doesn't do anything for, mm -hmm. you know, bad ideas are still bad ideas. Right. Yes, right here. So how do you think about products where you have to educate the consumer so I think you're talking about uh, like a disjoint, right? Something comes along that no one's ever seen before. I mean, to me, that's the opportune time to start a company, right? Because the, the entrenched uh, people, uh, you know, for example, I use, you always use this example is the newspaper industry, right? The newspaper industry was a, 
used to print money, right? All the wealthiest families in the country that own newspapers, I mean, they're, they're billionaires, super rich. Um, so what were their assets? You know, why were, they, why were they so successful? You know, they had printing presses, and they had delivery routes, you know, they had uh, journalists, you know? All of a sudden the internet comes along, boom. All those assets become liabilities. And they weren't, you know, companies aren't willing to cannibalize. No, no company will do this. And that's what Innovator's Dilemma, I think, one of the greatest messages they, they, they send is that no one's going to cannibalize a high gross margin business. And so the best time to come in is, um, is, is when one of these disjoints happen. Now, it's, a, it's, it's difficult. You know, one of our original ideas was to do um, basically monster.com. This is back in early 1995. And, and I, I interviewed uh, 10 HR, VPs of HR, and I said, hey, how would you like to put your resume on the internet? You know, wouldn't that be good? And they're like, uh, no interest. I, I don't know what the internet is. I don't know why you're talking to me. No interest. So, you know, I, I said, okay, well, no one's interested in that. And that was a mistake because I, I looked, I, I didn't approach it the right way. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the best markets, the best companies, I think, come out of, out of these disjoints where you've got to educate people. Thank you. Mark, so what role does happiness in your life play in your day to day, and how would you advise young people with regards to that? So I used to give the wrong advice to people. Uh, I used to say, follow your passion. Always follow your passion. You know, whatever you love, you know, you should do it. Uh, and the reason that I think that's a wrong advice, and, and you know, passion, I think is, I don't know what happiness is, but you know, a lot of times, passion and happiness are probably, probably related, right? Um, but you know, I was really passionate about wrestling. I was going to be, uh, uh, I was going to be a Olympic champion of wrestling. Uh, the problem was, is that uh, I blame it on my parents. Um, you know, I just genetically was not a, a gifted athlete. As Zach, who plays basketball with me, knows. I'm a decent athlete, but I'm sure as hell not an Olympic athlete. So I was very passionate about it, but there's no way I was going to be successful. So I think the bigger thing, I think, is to really follow your talents. So one of the questions we always ask people is, like, what, I what are you better than, you know, you're, where are you 1% in whatever you do? Uh, now, it just so happened for me, and that's where I got confused and was giving bad advice for so many years, is my passion and my talent actually happen to be the same. So if you're lucky enough, this is a luck question, uh, to have those aligned, then, then you know it's beautiful. Life is life is really good. Um, but it's also you know it's also my Achilles heel, right? So you were talking about uh, you know sociopath. I mean I'm sociopathic about like startups. So I get completely obsessed. You know I almost you know, you lose time. You, you you don't go home. You know your your family. <laughs> I miss most of my kids' stuff. It's one of the reasons we moved here, so I could actually play some role in my kids' life. I, so. How many kids? Three. Ages? The role, I spent enough time with them. I've <laughs> sufficiently screwed them up, so now I can do another startup. <laughs> so, it's good for them. Ages 21, 17, and 13. Nice. Okay, we've got time for one more question right here. So compare the value of formal education with on-the-job, like, gorilla experience. Yeah, I think so much, it's difficult to do that, right? So much of it is really comes down to the opportunities that you have in front of you. Uh, I think, you know, like with Peter Thiel, which I don't agree, you know, he says everyone should just drop out of school. I think that's just a ridiculous um, uh, recommendation for people. I mean, some people, you know, if you're a Larry Ellison or a Bill Gates, yeah, man, you should drop out of school because they, they dropped out for a reason, though. There was an opportunity facing them. Uh, back in 2008, I remember talking uh, 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 doing entrepreneurship classes, right? I mean, 2008, there was no jobs, nothing. I said, this is a perfect time for grad school. You know, go to grad school. You know, when the market sucks, there's no jobs, go to grad school. You know, but uh, I remember back in the internet days, 40% of Harvard uh, Business School uh, took a leave of absence. Mm. Um, and Stanford, the same thing. You know, so, you know, I think it just comes down to timing. You know, I think, personally, I think on the job, and that's one of the things that I, th I think we can offer at Find the Best is, like, people can come in. We have – our exec team is 26 years old, 25 years old. I mean, you wouldn't get that um, uh, at a bigger company or going, you know, formal educate. Well, they're all formally educated, but, you know, advanced degrees. But we have PhDs, too. So, I don't know. It all comes down to, you know, is that the best opportunity for you? Well, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to talk with you, Kevin. Thanks for listening.